And so this was, is an opportunity for all of us in the community to hear about the work that Amy is doing. Um, coming to us from Cornell University, which is my own undergraduate alma mater, so I deeply uh, approve. And um, working with botanical um, materials with Christine Hastorff's lab in lab three. Um, and notes from the highlands, not the Scottish highlands, the other highlands mm -hmm. as we usually talk about around field journey in South America. Right. The 2016 field season of Project Aragats and the state of Paleo Oh no, Armenia. Oh, the state of Paleo Environmental Studies of Bronze Minor Age Armenia. I had you in the wrong parts of the Mediterranean. Oh. Oh, this is even more. Well, I'm glad I have some surprises for everyone. It's a very small country, and so I know that not everybody necessarily uh, know its um, locations. Uh, it is a landlocked country, um, and the word Hayastan, which is Armenian for the country Armenia, actually means highland, so San being from the Persian word San, uh, land. Um, so it is a mountainous region, but it is very varied, um, and I'll go into a little bit um, uh, sort of how geographically and um, geologically and climate Wise, uh, you have a lot of different um, sort of uh, variation in this very, very small region. Uh, Armenia has had a very interesting past. Uh, it was first noted as a uh, written and the Byzantine inscription by Darius during the Kemenid Persian Empire. Um, so it's a very old empire. It's also, it was the first Christian empire, or I'm sorry, Christian state. Uh, so it very much holds to that uh, tradition. Uh, so Project Aravaps, where I work with, is uh, a project that's been working in Armenia, specifically the Sakahobi Plain, for the last 18 years. Um, it was started by Ruben Balian uh, and Adam T. Smith, who was then at the University of Chicago, but is now at Cornell, um, and I'm one of Adam's students. Um, and they uh, have continued in this area for uh, for a long period of time and had explored multiple sites in the region. Uh, I chose some pictures of some of our more famous sites. Uh, we have a site of Gekaro, which is an early bronze to late bronze site. Um, it's a full pop fortress site. Uh, and also of Sakahogi, which has both uh, late bronze and early Iron Age uh, deposit. So our project is fo focused mainly on the Bronze Age and the Iron Age in Armenia, but uh, there are other uh, sources of archaeological periodization as well. We do have Paleolithic sites and medieval sites, uh, but there are some holes in the chronology as well. We're, um, we're missing some data, which I will uh, show a little bit later. One of the unique things about our project is that it is truly a collaborative project. Uh, we work with the Armenian Ethnographic and Institute of Archaeology, uh, and we have a co-director, um, Ruben Balian, who is from that organization, uh, and then we have a partnership with uh, universities in the United States. Uh, Cornell is a part of it, and a lot of Adam students uh, have gone on to become co-directors themselves. So Ian Lindsay, who uh, was Adam's student when he was at UCSB, is now a co-director at Purdue, and Lori Dorian is a co-director at Cornell, and a lot of Adam's other students have continue to participate in the projects throughout their career. So it's a really great sort of community environment. So where is the project itself located in Armenia? So we sit at the base of Mount Argos. Um, Argos is the tallest peak in Armenia. Um, it's at 4,010 meters, I believe. It's uh, mainly a volcanic um, peak. So there is a, it's, it's a dormant volcano. It hasn't erupted. It, in quite some time, which is good for us excavating. Um, and our project sort of focuses on both the, the highland and the lowland valleys, um, especially on the Sakahobi Plain. So you can't really see this picture so well, but uh, you have Mount Aragats here, and we are excavating sites, multiple sites around the area. So another thing about our project is that we don't, we're not at one specific site. We are actually excavating multiple sites. And this has given us a really great way to sort of understand the landscape and how these, uh, what we have are these sort of hilltop fortresses and how they interact with each other on a larger scale and to understand the rise and maintenance and falls of each of these 
uh, late bronze um, and early iron and late, um, sorry, early bronze, late bronze, and early Iron Age societies uh, and how they interacted and inhabited the same landscape. And in many cases, they are actually inhabiting the same settlements. Uh, even with sort of holes in our chronology, we have uh, intrusions from uh, late bronze into Iron Age settlements, and we have Iron Age settlements that are built on the same hilltops as the Bronze Age settlements. So, we are seeing this sort of reuse of the similar landscape, even though they were under very different political structures. Uh, so here is sort of a chronology of the uh, Sakahobi plain. Uh, and as you can see, I've highlighted in red uh, the periods that are present on the plain. Um, so we have early bronze, late bronze, and uh, late iron. This is the main periods that our project <coughs> deals with. And as you see, there are gaps in this. Uh, in the Iron Age and the Iron uh, One and Two period, we have gaps during the Awartian period where see, people seem to be going down uh, further into the lowlands and are uh, moving away from the mountain areas. And then we have the Middle Bronze Age, which most likely people did inhabit the plain during the Middle Bronze Age, but it's a more ephemeral period and finding settlements is more difficult. Uh, so I'm going to talk about our 2016 field season and some of the activities that we've done. Uh, it was a very busy season, and like I said, we were working in multiple sort of areas. So we did pedestrian survey. Um, we also conducted, did some PixRF analysis of our obsidian that we found at um, our sites, look, looking to do some obsidian sourcing. Uh, we have a program of drone um, photogrammetry and photography. Um, and of course, we also did some excavation. So I'm going to talk first about our survey, we call it Kvass, I don't know if any of you guys have ever drank the Russian drink Kvass, <laughs> but it's sort of a play on that, it actually stands for Kazakh Valley Archaeological Survey, um, but we like the sort of kind of um, play that we had there. So this is our second year of survey uh, in this area. Um, we've had another survey in the Sakahobi Plain, which was done many years ago, um, but this is a new program of survey. And we have some new goals to be addressed. Uh, the main goals were to understand the dynamics of warfare and the impacts of violence uh, and the dynamics of these built-up fortresses on the social political structures during the Bronze and Iron Ages. Uh, so on our surveys, we're looking for fortress sites and settlements. Um, we're looking for burial clusters, especially high uh, concentrations of burial clusters, and also looking to uh, look for possible sites and for future excavation. So some of the challenges, and if some of you are in, you might know some of these challenges, with working in this area are one, we're in the mountains. Uh, so this means that when we are conducting pedestrian survey, we're climbing over hills, we're climbing into valleys, and there is sort of a, um, there people might get hurt, which we did have a couple injuries, unfortunately, this season, but everyone's okay, but the rock won. Uh, and we also have very poor visibility. Uh, artifact scatters in the area are basically, you cannot find artifact scatters unless it's uh, some sort of uh, soil erosion or if there's a trench or um, sort of anthropogenic hole that's been, been dug. So we really have to base most of our findings on architecture. Luckily, this the area is rich with the salt and tooth, and this is the, the uh, building materials that have been used since the early Bronze Age and continue to be in use today. So pretty much every period that we do find has used these as, uh, used stone as its building material. But uh, it's still in a rock-rich landscape, it makes it difficult to necessarily differentiate what is a architecture and what is necessarily ge geological. Another issue that we have is that Armenia was part of the former Soviet Union, which means that it was also part of collectivized farming. Um, and these, during the Soviet period, the, uh, the Soviets took large scale uh, bulldozers and completely uh, moved rocks and dirt from the valleys and put them into these large sort of field clearance walls so that they could plant uh, their different crops. 
So this means that a lot of what we think are maybe our settlements, which would have been lower in the valleys, have been sort of erased by this large scale uh, Soviet um, farming program. And well, I think that the, the land modification that the Soviet did is interesting in itself. It makes it very difficult to actually find earlier sites that are located in these areas. Now there are some things like they, a tractor can only go up a certain sort of gradient, so things like cordons uh, are somewhat intact if they're large enough, uh, where they just kind of run around them. And we find in these fortune sites because they are on hillsides that are very rocky. And also burial clusters seem to survive because they have made with a lot of rocks and it just the pain of moving them would have been too much. So there are certain features that are easier to determine, while some are a little bit more difficult. Uh, so this is just sort of our survey area. Um, the blue is highlighted of our Sakakobi Plain uh, survey that was done previously, and the red is our new uh, survey uh, area, which follows the Kazakh River, which is, is right here. Um, so some of our race site results uh, that we found this year is we found, and this is what we can find with last year's data as well, we found possibly 11 new fortress sites, which we're investigating. One of them is this possible med medieval period site that has this two meter wall called um, Saka Bear. Uh, this is a drone photograph from that site, and you can see there is this wall here, it's most likely this wall here. Uh, these sort of very large scale sites are quite kind of common in the region. And I'll show you some pictures of the ones that were excavated so you can understand um, the real scale of it. Uh, another thing we did was uh, ground truthing. We looking for Kurgan burials. Uh, and this is one of these sort of instances where these Kurgans were left intact uh, as the barley fields around them. So the Soviets were able to clear this field, but they left the Kurgans there. So we were able to go to these sites and verify that these do indeed look like Kurgans, but of course we don't know for sure until we uh, actually do some excavation. Um, another interesting sort of phenomenon um, that I find interesting because I'm interested in sort of agriculture practices is we found these what may be livestock corrals. Uh, they're these sort of horseshoe-like structures that are made out of stone. Uh, we don't know what period these would date to, but we do have modern examples from uh, Yazdi farmers who still practice agro-pastoralism up higher in the mountains. And so this is a a contemporary um, usage where they put these animals in these corrals. So we're starting to look at maybe ethnographically how we can link these and maybe date them to earlier periods and see if there is a long-term usage of these types of agriculture structures on the plane. Uh, some of our survey materials, even though we don't find a lot, uh, we did find some things that I think were kind of cool. We found this hand axe. Um, I am not somebody who works in the Paleolithic, Neurolithic expert, maybe one of you guys can kind of uh, know what period this comes from, but our one uh, ex or expert on the project was pointing towards maybe um, the Paleolithic and the Middle Paleolithic, but uh, I'm not entirely sure. We also found this uh, stela, which uh, we have named Stela Dan. Um, <laughs> I give credit to Alan Green for that. Uh, and uh, he will be going into the museum, um, the National Museum. They have quite a few of these in the museum. Um, and so those are some, just some of our larger finds that we found. Uh, we also did quite a bit of excavation this year. Um, our main goals with excavation were to continue our programs at Gehrot and to do some test excavations on one of our new sites, which is Alcaron Baird. So we have, uh, just to kind of show you how far in range our sites are, uh, Gangarot is up here. Um, and so we have one, or I'm sorry, two excavations at Gangarot growing, and then Alberoni Bear is back here. They're about 30 minutes away by car. Uh, that's where we did also two excavations, and we also had a test excavation in Lusaju. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about Gekharot and what our uh, our plans were and what our findings were for this season. So Gekharot is a very large uh, 
late Bronze Age and early Bronze Age uh, fortress on top of this hill pop. Uh, so this is a kind of a view from Gehara of the Sakagobi Plain. And most of our excavations, our large scale excavations in the past, have been uh, focused on the top of the hill top. Uh, so here we have found shrines that are related to the late Bronze Age, and we have found some evidence of settlements in the early Bronze Age. Uh, and we uh, trying to understand how this large hilltop relates to the fortress structure within um, this larger valley. Even the Russians have put a, an antenna on top of the hill, so the visibility is very good. Uh, but we were we have done lots of seasons of field work at the top of the mountain, so we're now trying to kind of go down a little bit and see if there are stuff lower in elevation. And indeed, we did find some. So this is further down the hill, it's still on the hill, but we found um, an early bronze Kuraraksa, uh, I won't say settlement, it was most likely more of a ritual space. Uh, we're still trying to determine, my colleague Gabrielle Bornstein, who's at Cornell with me, um, it was the excavator of this, and so she is in the process of sort of interpreting, interpreting the data and uh, what she found. And uh, what we found is these large semi-circle rock structures and a possible, or I'm sorry, a tomb that was intact along with a tomb that had been um, looted at some point. Uh, so there was this mixture between funerary practices and uh, sort of a massive architecture. So we're trying to understand how this works into a larger picture. My thing, one of the things that I'm doing here, is I took soil samples from the surfaces of this, uh, this uh, ritual space, I'll say, um, from to try to geographically distribute them, looking for uh, possible areas or uh, uh, that there were more graves. Sorry, excuse me. Um, so far, I'm, I'm doing this here at Christine's lab. So some of the things I found is that it does seem like we do have some areas of concentrated burning. We have a hearth, which is expected that we're of course find charred materials. But I've also found a more charcoal near one of our graves. And so I'm trying to determine, and I will do this with Gabby, to see if there may have been some sort of ritual influence, some ritual burning that happened near the funerary site. Our taxa that we're finding is very similar to taxa that we found on different parts of the site like before we find a lot of graves and a weedy taxa, which I hope to kind of plug into the greater environmental picture. Another sort of uh, excavation we did was of our pergons. Uh, so you can see this sort of jeep for size. Uh, these are very large pergon burials that we have. Uh, they're not as large as some that are in Eastern Europe, but they still are fairly uh, big in front of the area. And you can see uh, Garin, one of my colleagues, this is actually from last year, uh, in the central chamber of one of these large kurgans. Usually the, uh, they do include human remains, but the preservation is up in this area. This particular area of Gekro is quite poor, and so we don't have a lot of remains that um, we're able to excavate, but we do have a lot of ceramics, and we do have bronze. Uh, this year we found a, what we think is some sort of ceremonial drinking vessel. It's a large vessel that has four tiny individual vessels that are sort of perched on top. Um, and I've taken phytolith washes on that and I'm hoping to sort of get some insight. And I also have the soil to analyze, or not the soil, but the flotation from the soil um, to analyze to see if maybe we can get some ideas of what this vessel was used for. Uh, so another excavation we did, which was in its very early stages, is Aparani Bear. So this is the large, um, a large fortress site that's multi-period, and it ranges the material that we found in uh, when we did survey on this site. It ranges from the early bronze into the medieval period, and you can't really see it very well. But these are my test trenches, and they're like one by ones or two by twos on the hill. Um, so that gives you kind of an idea of how massive this structure is. So our goals with this is to try to understand um, where people were settled on this and how this works into the larger narrative of uh, 
hilltop fortresses. It's located by the Kazakh River, which is the main river running through the area. And to this day, people very much use it to have their livestock go through. Um, so it's a very active area. Um, so we think that it can give us some really great insight, but we're uh, doing some test excavations to try to figure out exactly what, what this fortress is, where people lived, and we're still uh, trying to ask those questions. This season, maybe it was a little, um, didn't clear it up as much as we wanted to. So our first test trenches were last year um, at the top of the fortress, and what we found was one sort of uh, perhaps a room um, wall that had was mostly associated with early Bronze Age material. However, there are some late Bronze Age material. This is on the western part of the the uh, the top of the hill. Um, so we're really looking to see. Is this a settlement that on top, or are they using the terrace structures, which, and our other excavations, they were very much using terracing uh, of the hillside. So this year, we looked at the western and eastern terrace. So I excavated the western terrace walls, and Lori Kachadarian and Adam Smith T. Smith uh, excavated the eastern trench walls. And what we found is, um, Mainly the western trench that I was working on was filled with early bronze material. Uh, we tried to excavate the terraces, but as you can see, with, with the livestock going through and with the water coming down into the Kazakh, these terraces have been sort of eroded over time, and so a lot of material has been sort of washed down the hillside and it's actually not in context anymore. So we believe that there was definitely an early bronze present on this western side of this fortress, but we're not sure where it is or even if we're going to be able to find it um, due to kind of the erosion over time. Um, but we did find one sort of wall and uh, found some reinforcing of the terrace at uh, different levels. So on the upper uh, trenches of the eastern walls, we or I'm sorry, eastern terracing, we found more evidence of walls, uh, and these really point to uh, early, and I'm sorry, late Iron Age and some late Bronze Age, but mainly uh, Iron Age materials. And so we think that there's sort of an interesting dynamic going on where maybe Iron Age settlements were on the eastern side and on the top, or uh, for some reason the western side was more used by the early Bronze and late Bronze. Um, but again, we're still trying to understand the dynamics, and with such a large fortress structure, we could just be not digging our trenches in the right places. So next year, we are going to be doing some GPR, and we're hopefully going to be able to try to understand where these settlements actually are. Uh, we also excavated some burials that are adjacent to the fortresses. Uh, we did three burials, one of them was a salvage op operation. There's a sand mining going on in the area, and there was a, a burial that was poking out of the side of the sand mine. So we did um, excavate that, it's a late Bronze Age burial. And then we found, we have two burials, one with only a few human remains in it, and then one with this disarticulated um, skeleton. Uh, so this was done by Dr. Maureen Marshall, and she is, she's an osteologist, and she is working on sort of uh, going through the bones and seeing, you know, aging, sexing, and, and trying to make sense of, of these burials. But one of the things that's very interesting about these burials is they're, they have a large stones, uh, sort of uh, these large cromlechs and large path stones, which means that it's very sort of difficult to get into them. Uh, and so we have a lot of our workers here, they're all a bunch of like 16-year-old boys, uh, move these large, very, very large stones. Um, but everybody was okay, and we got them out, and we were able to sort of look at these burials. So future excavation and survey goals uh, are to, we want to conduct um, GPR at the site to see uh, if we can find where the settlements are at Alperani Baird. We want to determine if we should go forward with large scale excavations, or if maybe there's another suitable site, and we want to continue excavating the burials. At Gager wrote the settlement that we started, we're going to continue 
excavating the um, late Bronze Age kurgans. We've done six in total. Usually one or two get done every year. Um, we want to sort of uh, finish them. I think there's only one or two left. Um, and then we want to continue with our early bronze settlement that we found this year um, to understand the dynamics. Um, with survey, we're going to continue with our pedestrian survey, and we're going to try to start excavating at maybe Kuchok or another Abrani Barrett site. Um, and we want to continue our program of aerial remote imagery. So one of the things I also wanted to talk to about, which uh, is part of my research, uh, is our paleo environmental goals for the project uh, going forward. So 2016, we, we, we won an NSF grant, and this included doing some uh, additional paleoclimatology and environmental reconstruction. Uh, so going forward, uh, I hope to sort of participate more in this process and we can gather some environmental data which has not really been uh, collected for the project so far beyond paleoethnobotany data. So we have funding for uh, analysis of the core that's already been taken and also taking a new core in the region. And we're partnering with a CNRS um, in France to do this work and they have done a large scale environmental work in the region and they're currently working on that. So this, we're hoping to contribute to a larger body of work. Uh, so I wanted to go into a little bit of the challenges of doing kind of paleo environmental reconstruction in this area. Uh, so this is, these are maps of the Caucasus in general. Uh, so because of its location in between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea, and the Southern Caucasus are south of the greater Caucasus Mountains, there is a lot of different sort of fluctuation in, um, in environments and a lot of different vegetations and geography. So we have everything from alpine regions to lowlands in the Arawak Plain, uh, we have desert arid regions in Azerbaijan, um, and then we have sort of these um, forested areas as well. So this is sort of an overview taken from the Caucasus environmental outlook that just shows the different sort of climate regions in the area and the different uh, categorizations of um, some of the vegetation. Uh, so I wanted to show sort of this picture of um, this variability. So this, this picture is taken from the Mill Plain, which is right around here, and Azerbaijan, which is a very flat desert area where this is um, the Ararat Plain, which is more of a grassland, um, grassland environment. And then we have from higher mountains up in Georgia. And you've seen, of course, my picture from Armenia, which is also a very mountainous region. So there's a lot of challenges in understanding these microclimates. And the main challenges is that one set of core from the region is not going to really tell us the, the complete environmental picture. Uh, so. There have been some archaeologists that have made some claims about uh, sort of more generalizations about cultures based on climate information. And while their, uh, their work may actually be right, we need to find out some more data in order to do that. I just wanted to use the Koroxes as a, an example of these sort of, um, sort of hypotheses. So Anthony Savona, who's at the University of Sydney, uh, has done a lot of environmental work at the site of Chilaretti. They've done sediment core analysis, pollen analysis, phytolith analysis. And he uh, has this hypothesis along with his, one of his students, Simon Connors, who does the environmental work, that the spread of the Karaxi's culture was due to the paleo uh, climate conditions being at an optimum. So that there was a warming in this area and this caused them to spread all over the Caucasus. Well, if you look compared to my, my picture and the, the spread of this culture, you can see that the variation in climate and geology and where these people live was actually quite different. And while Tony may absolutely be right, we can't really make this assumption for every region. For example, looking at paleoethnobotanical data, we see that at Gaga Road, which is the site that I work on, that we actually have a more dominance of barley. Um, Roman Hovassian, who is the uh, paleoethnobotanist that's been working at the site, attributes this to it being at a higher altitude because barley is more robust and can handle sort of cooler climates, whereas other peroxy sites do not have the same dominance of barley. So even just 
looking at these assemblages, we see that there are definitely changes. People are making decisions based on the environment that they're living in, which means that more studies have to happen um, throughout the greater region. So the French had this new project um, where they partnered with all the archaeological institutes in Azerbaijan, Georgia, and Armenia, which make up the Southern Caucasus to do a, both a local and regional analysis of the paleo environment. Uh, so they have, are doing sediment core analysis in Armenia and Georgia, and uh, soon, hopefully, in Azerbaijan. They're doing geomorphology in the Mill Plain in uh, Azerbaijan, looking at the rise and fall of the Caspian Sea, which has uh, fluctuated quite a bit throughout the Holocene, and also how this impacts the Kora and the Araxes River, which are very important archaeologically uh, because a lot of links to these rivers have uh, been discussed when we discussed the Araxes uh, expansion. Um, and they've also been doing local uh, studies. So they're doing paleontology at the site, spinal analysis at the site, and also paleoethnobotany to get an idea of how each of these factors contribute to a larger picture. So Project Argos is part of this larger picture, and we have done, we have worked in collaboration with them to do charcoal analysis at the site of Gekharot, and we also are going to be contributing and working with them, hopefully I will be working with them to do some paleontology on the sediment cores that we are extracting so that we can add one more sort of frame into this this larger picture. Uh, here's just one of the reports, I'm not really gonna go too into it, but this is one of the pollen reports that um, has been produced and uh, has also the pollen records that um, from other parts of the region, but yeah, I won't go too in depth into it. Uh, one of the other things that, I'm oh, sorry, this is got in there, um, that people, they make this assumption that the caucuses actually do not have a lot of paleoethnobotanical uh, information. This is actually incorrect. They, we have had people working uh, doing paleoethnobotanical work, and the Russians did some work as well. But there is a lot of work that still needs to be done, and it's very much uh, focused in particular time regions and particular areas. So Roman Hovassian, who is at the uh, Institute of Archaeology and Ethnography, is the Armenian paleoethnobotanist, and he has done quite a bit of work. Now, most of his work is focused on the Paleolithic, the Neolithic, and the Early Bronze Age, and this is due just to the projects that he works on. Uh, and then there have been some reports on the Iron Age. Uh, these were mainly done in the 1940s and the 1950s in Armenia, uh, done in Polish and Russian, and sort of taking Russian techniques, which at the time were very good, but we have improved a little bit um, since then, I hope. Uh, and then there is a lack of data in the late Bronze Age. So this sort of shows uh, the early Bronze across the Southern Caucasus, uh, the paleo-botanical data that we have for it. Um, and you can see there is a distribution, but we're missing a lot of data from Azerbaijan. We have it only in sort of areas of Russia. Part of this, or sorry, the Georgia, part of this correlates to where the Karaxi sites are, but there's still a lot of work. So one thing that we're hoping to sort of contribute to as a project is that we have, we're focused on late, the late bronze and the Iron Age, we also have some medieval uh, period sites, so how can we add to this greater data set uh, and expand not only the early bronze information, but also the uh, late bronze and the Iron Age as well. So, we are going to continue to look at uh, the paleoethnobotanical data. We see, like I said before, sort of the dominance of barley and wheat in the area. Um, the main focus of the research has been on agriculture processing, uh, which we see a lot of uh, sort of mixed uh, grains with both wheat and barley uh, growing. And we really, I, sorry, I think that um, we have a lot of uh, barley also because it, since it is a mountainous region, we are doing a lot of, there's a lot of pastoral activity, so they're most likely using this for fodder. Um, so those kind of questions are still need to be 
addressed, but we also have a lot of lead taxa that's been identified but has never been contextualized or interpreted. So this is a great opportunity to sort of go back through a lot of the data that we have and understand not only the agriculture practices, um, but also understand some of the um, environmental data as well. So uh, some of the studies that we hope to do in the next year is to continue our projects with paleoethnobotany, um, add an anthropological lens to what's already been published, uh, we have had limited pollen phytolith analysis on the site, so I hope to uh, go forward and do some more of that on a site-specific level. We have quite a few instances where we have done pollen washes, but they have not actually been processed. Uh, and we have had world wood charcoal uh, interpretation, um, but we need a little bit more of it done. Um, and then, of course, the core is from Shankani which is the core that's already been extracted and the new settlement core. So hopefully this will you know, give us a lot more insight into the overall climate, not only in our past, but contribute to this later, larger body of research in the region. And the Caucasus is a great area to do this sort of research and look at it from a uh, more global perspective and what contemporary uh, climate studies do to its range and from mountains to deserts. It can really give us some insight into how humans interacted during these sort of extreme environments. So thank you. <laughs>
Um, this is during the Kemenid period where they're acting as a satrap, but they're actually kind of further removed from a centralized authority. Uh, so they are not under the same sort of stress of everyday violence and warfare that we see in the late Bronze Age. So uh, working into the environmental issues and the agriculture issues is how are people under these and having the same landscape and having the same settlements, how were they um, sort of dealing with these overall political structures? How did this influence their agriculture decision making? Did the landscape just dictate some sort of uh, agriculture decision making? Or were this, did the social, how did the social structures, how did that influence it? And also, was any kind of climate change, uh, did that have any sort of impact on this whatsoever. We know that um, the Iron Age that people go down into uh, underground um, and they have their houses mainly underground. So this could be attributed to colder climate, but we don't know. It could also be for multiple other reasons. So how like how do these greater things work into this larger narrative of warfare? Is that it is 
fairly high, you can see a lot in the landscape, but it also kind of is covered, there's a, like a bowl that goes into the closet. So, you know, we haven't found any sort of evidence, but it might be a good place to kind of keep your animals and keep your crops that are out of sight, but still be able to kind Is of anyone doing these sort of bucha analysis things of them? Or the, like the kinds of, I was thinking of the sure, things you've done. Sure. Well, we haven't done it at this, um, at our area, but uh, there haven't, uh, Tiffany Early Spidori has done it on the Amortian period, um, on the Amortian fortresses, because Amortian too also maybe still have fortresses and found you know, definitely, you know, um, maybe the possibilities of fire begin. It would be very interesting to see if you do have these two different periods in the same general location. Right. The shift when you go downhill, what what is the landscape that right. you look absolutely. at? Right, absolutely, absolutely, yeah. Um, yeah. Very cool stuff. <laughs> um, I was wondering, uh, I noticed some of the sites are very shallow stratigraphy. This is a, it seems like all the modern agriculture is happening elsewhere. That during the Soviet period, did they have a lot of investment down low where they did the tractor and the piscine? And so, leaving these higher sites. Yeah. Right. Well, this, the sites that I showed of Avrani Bear are actually, uh, that, that's because it was at the very, very top. So, I think over the, the, um, the years, it's sort of been washed away. And so, we hit bedrock pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. um, other sites like Agehero or Sakobi, which I didn't really talk about on our hilltop. So we've had like much lower um, stratigraphy, uh, but when it comes to the settlement period where the Soviets actually did um, do their land amelioration projects, uh, we haven't actually explored anything um, down there because it's so vast. Uh, they are doing modern crops; they grow barley to this day there. Mm -hmm. um, we had when we were doing survey, we we're mapping sort of the Soviet. Uh, clearance walls and any sort of uh, features, and we're trying to do some satellite, we have some satellite imagery that may um, date prior to some of this, these land transformations, so we're trying to understand that, um, but we really don't understand uh, the valley at all, because we just haven't. It, it, at this point, I mean, we know if we, we dig, we'll probably find material, but um, finding settlement context is just, like, it's amazing. Oh, she mentioned earlier. So, you know, one of your photos, you were walking the plowed field. Yeah, yeah. So we are walking the field because, like I said, the kurgans usually um, do stick out in the landscape uh, because they were never tractored over. And also the other burial prominent clusters. Uh, so we do walk the landscape, but unfortunately we don't usually find uh, anything in the fields. We, in fact, this year, so last year we did a lot of survey in the sort of lower valleys and it, we did not have a lot of results. So this year we've gone higher up on the mountainsides, um, just so that we can get some better data. Maybe so, to dig deeper in the valleys, not have to use it, some large machinery to actually excavate the lower. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, that's one of the things we hope to do at some point. Um, we just need to find a target area. So, yeah. Okay. Um, thank you. I was wondering what there were any textual sources that you were engaging with, or like what this region is referred to, maybe in like Mesopotamian texts, or if, are there texts from this? From this I, no, this is, even in the Iron Age, uh, well, I should say the Iron Age three period is basically prehistoric in this area. The war actually did have um, text in cuneiform, but um, I'm not using uh, any of those textual sources. So there's, there's mention, I said, Armenia and the Byzantine inscription, um, and I am not familiar enough with the Mesopotamian text to, to really know um, if, if any references to the Highlands or not. But, yeah. <laughs> We'd love to find a text. We're, we're hoping that there's like a Darius so inscription right around the corner, but we haven't found it yet. Is there a big site here that, that's like a, like a big, like a, name, a place named site or something in, in the southern Caucasus that is? Sure, sure. So basically, the War II period is in between the late Bronze and the late Iron Age, um, and that's the period we just don't have anything at our site. Now, there are, there's a lot of research that's been done about the War II, but I just I have, don't have a lot of exposure to it. But um, basically, what we're dealing with in the early Bronze and the late Bronze. That 
they may well be referring to this place, but if you don't have a complementary textual basis, you aren't necessarily going to be able to match those up. That's so you, you know that there's this behemoth over there that they're right. having relations with. Right. And they may be talking about you all the time but calling you something weird. Right. Right, right. absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So. yeah, I mean it isn't really until the uh Kevin period that we can Is, but even then, we don't know that today's Armenia, uh, the extent the, of Armenia in the classical period was, and during the war period, very, very different than what it is today. So we are technically at one o'clock. Um, I didn't see any other hands, but before we walk out of the room, it, was somebody else sitting there hoping to ask a question? Ah, we have one last question. Are these basically, uh, might they be considered Scythians? What becomes Scythians? No, no, the Scythians are actually um, like on the other side of the Caspian Sea. That's where so. I had you. I thought ah. I had you. <laughs> I'm hoping you're on the same. So on that note, let's thank.